Hi, fam. Can you believe this is our 80th time that we've gathered in these airwaves together? <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Time flies when you're having fun. And today, we're ending out Love Week here with my special guest and handsome hubs, Patrick Morris. So settle in because it's family time. I'm Nicole Morris, licensed marriage and family therapist and mental health correspondent. And let me be the first to say, welcome to the family. The OCD family, that is. I am here to create a community of support for family members, spouses, partners, parents, adult children, as there may be adult words, and chosen family of OCD sufferers and their community. I've had over 22 years of experience in the mental health field, but please note that this information does not qualify or substitute as a diagnostic evaluation, therapy, or treatment, and it is presented on an as-is basis. Please follow up with a qualified mental health provider in your area regarding concerns for yourself or loved ones. Thank you for joining us today. Now, let's get started. Alrighty then. Bam! It is so good to be with y'all this week, and as if I needed another reason to love Fridays. I mean, I love Fridays because A, it's Friday, bring on the weekend, but also it's Friday, which means I can count on this time, our family time, with a new episode every week here at OCD Family Podcast. And I have to say, it's, it's just the perfect bookend to my week. So thank you for joining us here and a special welcome to our new fam. Hey, because there's always room at the table for you. So today we are rounding up Love Week and I'm calling it Love Week because, you know, we just had Valentine's a few days ago. If you're part of our replay fam, you're like, OK, sure. And, you know, Valentine's, it really is one of those love it or hate it kind of holidays. I get that this week can often feel very hard for people. You're grieving losses. You're feeling lonely, struggling in relationships. And for some, it can feel awesome. It's a celebration of a new love or new interest, new excitement. So whether it's been great or raw and painful, I see you. And I guarantee you're not alone. Last week, we had the pleasure of chatting with OCD expert John Hirschfield, and during my intrusive thought segment, which is the application segment, concluding each and every full-length episode, I challenged us to redefine Valentine's and claim a piece of it for our own, to lean in and show ourselves some love, to engage in some self-care. And I even shared that I would give away some free merch to anyone that tagged me on social and let me know they were loving on themselves because I want to love on you loving on yourself. I am here for it and I want to reinforce that because it's so important. So while I'm not quite two years into this podcast gig, I have noticed a really interesting trend. When it comes to free stuff, either there's a lot of interest or no participation at all. And that's okay. I'm still learning the best way to support you fam and others and figure all these pieces out. So, while well, I was going to announce our receiver of some free merch regarding the self-care and ways you were loving on yourself, I actually didn't get any tags to that end. And you know what? That's okay. But in the interest of transparency, and because I said we were going to do this, I just wanted you to know, fam, because it's the fam. We keep it real. But I still want us to think about ways we can reflect and think about love for ourselves. So, I am going to reserve today's intrusive thought segment for just that. And I even found a few helpers to support our efforts. So we'll get to that in a bit. But for now, I am welcoming back my handsome hubs, Mr. Patrick Morris. And I tell you, I always appreciate when he can come on the show because he and I both have the experience of being where you are, fam. We're loved ones. We're spouses. We're parents. We're children of our own OCD warriors. And while I think he does an incredibly good job around learning and articulating thoughts around all of these really tricky concepts, particularly when it comes to OCD, he's not a clinical person. So I always find it really helpful to scale back. And even though I love and appreciate all of the amazing professionals and researchers that come on the show, give up their time, it's good to recalibrate sometimes and just talk about what it's like living with OCD in our family. So he's coming back today and we're going to talk about ROCD, which is the acronym for Relationship OCD, because it's Love Week, y'all, right? So what better time to focus on this common subtype of OCD? But I have a twist this time. Oh, because although Patrick and I have chatted about ROCD before, in fact, I'll even link that last episode on this episode's blog post over at OCDFamilyPodcast.com. I've had a shift in how I think about ROCD 
really over the past year, I'd say. In fact, I think learning about inference-based CBT and understanding inferential confusion a bit better has actually been a catalyst for some of that shift. So we're going to talk about ROCD, and I know I'm super curious to hear Patrick's thoughts on it, as well as yours, fam. So I'm going to invite my Valentine back to the show so we can dive right in. Welcome back to the OCD Family Podcast. Today I have the pleasure of welcoming back my handsome hubs. Hello. Patrick Morris. Hi, Patrick. Welcome back. Thank you for having me back. I'm always happy to be here in the studio. (laughs) You are here in the studio. (laughs) Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. It's Valentine's week. It's love week. So Patrick's in the studio and I prompted the OCD fam to do something to invest in them, to say I love you to you. Because often we're hardest on ourselves and it's one of the hardest people to love in our lives. So what do you think about that, Patrick? Yeah, I think that's true. I think many people really struggle with that. I would say I have certainly had my fill of struggles in that area. I've gotten better at it in recent years, just sort of making sure I take the time to do the relaxation that I need or whatever. And it's just been one of those things that I think is it's actually harder to learn how to do it right than a lot of people think it would be. Yeah, I think what's interesting is one of the things I wanted to talk about, we've talked about it a little bit on the show before, but I wanted to talk about relationship OCD because it it is the season. It is love week. True. Right. And so we think of relationship OCD, and I had you on before to talk about this as well. Yeah. But, you know, it's been interesting because when we talked last time, I really conceptualized relationship OCD more through an exposure and response prevention lens, which is one of our evidence-based practices that we use to treat OCD. And really, since that conversation... I've learned a lot more about inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy as well, which is another evidence-based practice that we use to treat OCD. And ROCD is one of those things that is one of those themes of OCD that can be really tricky. So we talked about it before, and and fam, you're welcome to go back and listen to that. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to revisit it, not only because it's love week, and not only because for so many OCD themes, we could talk about it multiple times, and there's still value in having conversation about it. But now that I know inference-based CBT, it's shifted a little bit of my conceptualization around relationship OCD. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my understanding, and and there will be some folks that say, oh, this isn't what ERP is about, but I feel like it was fundamentally about this for a long time, and a lot of people still hold to that, is this difficulty holding uncertainty. And so there's uncertainty. And so when you think about that through relationship OCD lens, you think about, okay, what does uncertainty mean? And to you, if I were, you know, I am, I'm going to ask you that question. What does uncertainty mean to you, Patrick? Just in general or in terms of relationships? Well, both. Okay. Let me think. Well, so it's funny. Like, had you asked me that 10 years ago, (laughs) I probably would have said, It's the fear of the unknown and all these like negative terms. Mm -hmm. But uncertainty to me is actually a neutral word these days. Really? Tell me more. Yeah. It's like, I, I don't know. I have gotten to a place personally where I just, there's a lot of things that go on in life that aren't pleasant. Like you see people you love getting sick or whatever, or you know that you're, time may be running out with certain people or you know that there's questions about maybe how somebody you love is doing it and stuff and whatever it is all these things that you could chalk up to feelings of uncertainty or just like your personal life but all of those things while they aren't pleasant i don't know how or why but i've just had so much peace lately about the uncertainty it's almost like me what uncertainty is is just being okay with not knowing what's going to happen. Yeah. The not knowing. The not knowing. Yeah. Right. And and for me, I would have said that was a negative thing like a thousand times before. But nowadays, it's like, okay, I don't know. I don't know a lot of things. And that's okay. Yeah. 
One thing I could point to that I think might be different for you. So we've had some debates back and forth on <laughs> who all in the family has OCD. And I've hypothesized yes. <laughs> that you, as well as so many, <laughs> have OCD. But I think really through the process of the whole family, and not just for yourself, but for understanding me, your mom has been on the podcast and open about her uh -huh. struggle with OCD. Jack has been on our son yep. talking about OCD. So it's it's certainly impacting you in multiple different relationships. And there are other family members that are at different places with their self-disclosure and understanding. So, you know, I'm not going to out anybody in terms that hasn't been public with that. But I think part of what's made it different, and you can tell me if you feel differently, is accepting the uncertainty really has been a huge piece of, well, and especially within exposure and response prevention, has been a huge piece of the treatment. Absolutely. Yeah. Accepting, and going... accepting the uncertainty. I would even go so far as to say even embrace it. Like there are some things about the uncertainty. Radical that's... acceptance. <laughs> There's some things that excite me, not about the things that nobody likes, like seeing loved ones get sick or something, but things like not knowing what comes next in my career. I'm still relatively young, so maybe, you know, maybe if 20 years you can ask me from now if I still feel the same way, I guess. But like, there's a lot of uncertainty. It used to be that I would be anxious about absolutely everything, including like, how a meeting was going to go with a colleague or mm -hmm. how I would be perceived, you know, by somebody walking down the street. And I'm so thankful that those days are gone. And I think a lot of it is just embracing the uncertainty, like who knows what they're thinking about me yeah. and just getting on top of it. And somehow that it just it works. And me. it's and it's hard. It's hard to do. And it's, it's very hard, hard to get there. Oh, my gosh. It took me like decades to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a big part and a big process in treatment, particularly when we think about exposure and response prevention is embracing that uncertainty. Also, I talked a couple of weeks ago with Erica, who was just gracious in, in sharing her amazing story with us. And she talked about radical acceptance. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. Which is out of RODBT, so radically open dialectical behavioral therapy, teaches this concept of radical acceptance. And so it, it is interesting that one thing I will say to a lot of new clients that come to see me, and I try to reiterate when I think about it here on the podcast, is that even though there's no great takeaways that we go, oh, yay, you have OCD. Yay for you. Woohoo. Right. At the same time, one of the silver linings is so many people. I mean, if you think about advertising, we just had the Super Bowl last weekend and everything's advertising what's going to make the better, prettier, sexier, richer, more fulfilling life. Right. And everyone's seeking that answer of like, what's going to make it better? What's going to make it better? And it's not to say that doing treatment isn't going to make you desirous of things being better. But at the same time, being able to embrace uncertainty is one of the biggest gifts. It's a silver it's lining. It's a huge gift. It's a huge gift. It's a silver lining. I wouldn't wish OCD upon anybody to gain that. But being able to embrace that is a huge gift. Anybody with an open mind and an open heart to whatever it is they need to do for therapy and getting help can achieve it. I'm, I'm confident of that. Yeah. Cause I mean, I was really anxious back in the day. I mean, super, super, super just, I remember I'd go to work feeling completely destroyed by my anxiety and mm -hmm. I would be in, I'm sure people in the audience can relate to this. I'd go into a, a meeting where Everyone was talking about different stuff, and then it would get to my part in the meeting. And it's like in these little conference rooms. And I still remember getting to a place where I would get so nervous that I would just freeze and I would just stop talking. And they would look at me and I was frozen. I'm amazed that they didn't like kick me out of that office. But yeah, it was just like I would just get so nervous. I would just sit there mm -hmm. and not even speak even though they were like talking directly to me because your brain goes into fog mode when you're that anxious. It just turns into total fog. Like you can't even like 
I don't know if it's a fight or flight reaction or what, like if your brain is conserving energy or what's happening, but it's literally like your brain shuts down when yeah. you get that anxious. So I've been there and I can tell you it's worth the work to get to the other side for sure. Yeah. And sometimes you wonder, like, does the other side exist? Is it a mirage? It exists. It, it, <laughs> and it, it does. does. Yeah. It, does. it is. It's something that it sounds like lip service, but when you feel it, it's undeniable when you go, oh, my gosh, I didn't know. Like, you feel that that weight lift off your chest and you're mm -hmm. like, I didn't know life could be like this. And it's a gift. So if you were applying mm -hmm. the idea of uncertainty to relationship, then what would that mean for you? What do you think the main quandary is? Gosh, I mean, again, it's going to depend on every person and probably the culture that they're in. I mean, everybody has different ideas about what relationships, and I, I'm speaking specifically of romantic relationships, what relationships are supposed to, air quotes, supposed to look like. I think that to answer your question, I would say for me, having been in the Christian bubble at an early age, I came into this idea of you have to be so careful about who you pick and everything because marriage is for life and marriage is for life. And I will never, ever consider anything else. But Thanks, the problem is this idea you, that there's a perfect 10. Yeah, there's a perfect at, at 10. And I saw so many people in the community I would see at church and stuff. I saw so many of them, the men especially, totally frozen, unable to do anything in re any relationships, unable to take any steps forward because there was this feeling of like, it has to be perfect. And I don't know. I just, I think that like our OCD can look a lot of different ways, but like to me, like getting so obsessed about perfection is a big one for a lot of people. I am so impressed. You are? I am. Well, thank you. Because <laughs> here's why. This is actually where I was going to go with it too. And it's not exactly where I would have gone with it just out of an ERP mindset and where I was before. But uh -huh. here's why. I think that a lot of times people think, am I with the wrong person? Like a lot, I, th I think if I were to pull 10 random people and said, Give me an example of uncertainty in relationship. They would probably be like, oh, what if I am with the wrong person? Right. Or what if <clears throat> I let the one true love of my life get away and we broke up and now I'm never going to find happiness like that again? Right. It would have to do with this idea. Well, not just even this idea, this ideal. Not, Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And what is an ideal ideal is beyond sometimes even perfection but at its base if you really if you were to dilute it down make a nice little reduction out of it it would boil down to this concept of perfection and i think that's pretty insightful because i think most people myself included mm -hmm. didn't even think about rocd so much as a perfectionism problem but I think really learning more about inference-based CBT and in inference-based CBT, we map out these things called obsessional sequences. Now, I'm not going to go deep into ICBT right now. So if, fam, if you're tuning in and you're like, what is with all the letters? We got the RODBT and the ICBT and the ERP and the OCD and all the things, the right? ROCD. ROCD. You're right. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> We have R-O-D-B-T and R-O-C-D. I didn't even... E-R-P. I was making this so much trickier than it needed to be. But what I would say is if you're interested in knowing more about ICBT or ERP, please feel free to go back and check some of the earlier episodes. In particular, I think the water cooler chats do kind of a, a nice drive through explanation of both. But in ICBT, inference-based CBT, we map out these obsessional sequences. And so what we say is the problem isn't that we got stuck in this loop of doing compulsions and we need to do this response prevention to change it. Yes, that works. Yes, there's research to show that that works. But that's not actually the mechanism for why we were having this problem in the first place. Now, you can address it that way. And many people have. And they've, they've found freedom through that. And so this is not a dis on ERP. But 
if you're approaching it in an obsessional sequence, what you first look at is you have this trigger that leads to an inference of a doubt, an obsessional doubt, right? And so I think oftentimes people at that obsessional doubt point, which is just barely getting into the sequence, but really where we stop in ICBT, because if we can fix the doubt, if we can rectify that and base it in here and now reality and evidence, we don't even have to go through what's the meaning of this, what's the distress I feel as a result of this, and what's the compulsion. And so in thinking about this, and I, whether working with clients or just having conversations with colleagues in the field, I think it's so easy to stop at that obsessional doubt and go, well, the trigger is I'm in the relationship and I don't know if I'm happy. Right. Or I'm happy, but could I be happier? Right. Could I? I mean, the, the, the answer is always going to be yes. Even always. You like won the lottery. Could you be happier? I'm sure. I'm sure yes, there's a way. There's always a way to be there's happier. There's a way, right? With anything. But yes. but is that obsessional? I mean, I think if you ask a hundred different people, they're like, no, of course. That's that's understandable, reasonable, realistic. Can I, can I tell you a quick story? I love stories. So when I was working at uh, a company, I won't name names necessarily, but I was working at a company a long time ago out in the Santa Monica, L.A. area. And I remember going to this really swanky business dinner out in Beverly Hills. They had like rented this private room. It, it was a <laughs> fancy business that didn't spend their money well, but there was always these dinners that the managers were doing and stuff. So I'm not going to say no. Anyway, I went to this and I remember in particular, I had just gotten the ring for you for to get to propose and i was like 32 or something at the time sharing it with some guy i don't remember his name sorry some guy i don't remember your name oh that's some guy is listening but he's like hey but i was sharing guys? i was Why? sharing it with him and he was probably like 25 and i was explaining like yeah i'm getting engaged and i just got the ring and all this and he was looking at me, I, I kid you not, like I was an alien from outer space. He was looking at me like, but, but like, how could you ever know who to, to do that with? Like, <laughs> like he looked at me like, this is impossible. Like he looked at me like I was absolutely off my rocker. You would have thought that no one had ever heard of getting married before the, the way he was talking. He's like, what, wait, what you're, you're doing that. Like, not not like, oh, you're going to be locked in. It wasn't any of that kind of stuff. It was literally like he didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I had to explain to him. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm getting engaged, which I thought was normal. And he's <laughs> like. In L.A., it's and, like. And he was he was literally. But he but what was so cool about that conversation was it was like out of pure, genuine place in his heart. Like, he wasn't making fun of me. He wasn't doing anything weird. He was just genuinely shocked and did not understand how it was. And he asked me directly, he's like, but how do you feel comfortable that you've ever made the right choice? Like, how could you ever know? And I said, well, I mean, I believe that you make a choice and then that person's the right one because they're the one. Because that's the choice you made. Because that's the choice how I you, made. How do you know you picked the right avocado? You might squeeze it first, but the right. one you get is the one you get. Could it there been? Squeeze it. Could it? Goodness, it appears yes, on yes. avocados. My yeah. avocado people are like, I get you. No, I get, I you, get you too. Which reminds me, I remember when we first moved here, I was at the store and this older gentleman came up to me and he was like, my wife said to get avocados out or I pick one. And they were like all hockey pucks. They were so tough. And I was like, this isn't your jam, man. He's like, you don't understand. I got to come back with an avocado. And I said, tell her, tell her it was a hockey puck. And he was like, <laughs> I'm like, trust me, she'll be like, oh, because it's useless. It's too hard. It's not ripe yet. Yes. And I'm sure there's a life lesson in there somewhere. You know what? I mean, I'm going to use the ripeness in analogy exactly. here because exactly. that's how I roll. But it's like, how do you know, is there one that's more ripe? Could it be less ripe? What if I'm not? What if I don't? What if I'm not looking enough? What if I don't know what firmness is anymore? Right. What if my gauge for firmness isn't the same as the gauge of everybody else around me? Which wouldn't matter. That would be irrelevant yeah. if it's what for if you I'm and not for everyone and else everyone around else you. Is, or what if I'm settling and everyone else is getting the better avocados because I don't know what a good avocado is? I feel like we could have had this conversation 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, my word. We could have. But even 10 years ago, I was getting engaged to you. I know. Well, more than 10 years ago. We were married 10 years ago. But Right. Yeah. 
but, but what the, po- was... the point is, the point is though is like this kid though that i was talking to he was just he did not understand it yeah well and what's interesting okay so i counter your story with another story a memory of mine and then i'll get to the actual okay. point of all this <laughs> but it made me think of this yes do you remember when we were dating and you lived off the really nice area of West L.A. Mm-hmm. And kind of by the Grove, if anyone's familiar with that area, near CBS Studios where they shoot Dancing with the Stars, things like that. Uh-huh. But anyway, we were dating and you and I went to the Edison downtown because one of my best friends from childhood and her husband were in town. I remember. Visiting. Yes. And so, and we, you know what? I should pull up a picture. We went to the Edison downtown where you had to like, there was a dress code to get in. It was real swanky. You kind of got in through the oh, bouncer. You go down to the basement. It's so like fun. This old speakeasy. It's the original Edison. It is. They have Edisons around now, but yeah, that you, was like the we original went, one. We went with your sister and our brother-in-law. Orlando. In Orlando. But that's yeah. a very different vibe. Very different. And much, it feels like much easier to get in. Because it's like well, Disney World territory. The one in Orlando is like Steve. commercialized. Yeah. But the one in L.A. is the like an LA, actual fancy club. You wouldn't necessarily know yeah. it's there unless you yes, knew. Yes, exactly. You walk up. Some, you have to meet a dress code, which they love a good dress code in L.A. Yep. And you couldn't wear like open-toed shoes if you were a man. There were all sorts of different things. Unless you were super cute and then they didn't care what you were wearing. And so we went down, <laughs> we went down, loved the Edison, met up with one of my dear friends, one of my best friends from elementary. I remember. And they talked about meeting each other and they knew. They knew that they were going to be together and we oh, had yeah. dated like six months or so. I don't even know how long we had been dating. Uh, oh yeah, they told us this and we're like, really? Well, like, how is it? <laughs> okay, so Patrick's like, Got like anxious fumes seeping out of him because oh, he yeah. he had he very much had this vibe of well am I supposed to know I didn't know like that though and yeah. he had a very difficult very painful breakup and end of a relationship before we dated so he was dealing with some of that but also he was also like oh, how do you know kind of thing yeah. and it's funny to hear because just then within about a year and a half time you were like i mean what do you mean this is pretty normal but again i th- I think even you and i had to process i was like that's not us that's them and good for them like i'm glad they felt yeah. some positive vibes could they have found better partners out there could anybody go find something bigger, better, smarter, sexier, funnier? 100%. But for sure. Everybody like you can. can. Find, you can always find, just like you can always, it, it's similar to that conversation of, I'm upset, but there's people that have it so much worse off. Sure, we can always find someone that's worse off. Right. We can always find someone better. And so often, I think the misstep is getting caught up on the question of, you know, but what if there is someone better out there? Oh, honey. There's someone better out there. There's always <laughs> someone better out there. Right. 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 It doesn't mean you found your perfect, absolute person. It's just the you, wrong focus. Right. You found your seven out of 10. And could you, you can make seven out of 10s work in a lot of different ways. And it's not to say that anything. I'll always be your seven. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Valentine's. <laughs> I'm going to write that on the card. I know. I'm your seven. Apparently seven is a lucky number if you ask Jack. So anyway, but (laughs) but what I would say is, and that's not a diss to Patrick. I would say I'm a seven too, right? You know, or whatever. Pick a number. The idea is that there's a perfect 10 out there and there's not. Can you find someone better? Yeah. Can you find someone worse? Yeah. Do you love this person? Like, it's not even a matter. Could I love someone else more? I mean, possibly, probably. Could I love someone less? Sure. For sure. For sure. For sure. Right. Well, and if you think about it, too, I'm just thinking of this as we are talking. There's an obsession out there, to use the word. And I feel like this is something that I do struggle with a lot, even now. There's an obsession out there with wanting to make sure that you get absolutely the most out of life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I need to be as successful as possible, have the best possible life, do all the things that I could possibly do in my lifetime. And I don't want a single regret. And I want to know that I did it all. 
it's like that old song, my way, you know what I mean? And having that as your motto. And it's like so many people today are that way. I mean, like there's this epidemic of people not having kids, for example, because they want to live their life spending money on themselves. And I'm not going to say that it's the wrong choice because everybody can make their own choices. I'm not trying to disparage anybody. Mm -hmm. But what I am noticing is that there is, and I'm guilty too. I have kids, but I'm guilty of the same thinking, mm -hmm. which is like this obsession with making sure that I didn't make a mistake. I did everything I could. I got all the wealth I could get. I got all the things I could possibly want, tasted everything of the world that I could get my hands on. And it's like, yeah, that's hedonism. It's it's this sense of like feeling like you've got to get as much as you can of everything. And I think that that probably drives a lot of our OCD as well, because I could see that depending on how that pathologizes inside certain people, it could turn into an obsession to the point where you're unwilling to sort of settle at all with anybody. Yeah. Settle down, not settle like for less than you could, but just settle down at all, like make a choice. Right. Yeah. I think that there's, it's, I think that that's what people fear. They don't want to give up the autonomy or the ability to continue to sample the hors d'oeuvres out there and keep going. And it's like, at a certain point though, I think in my life, I've found that restraint and having limits on everything is better. Yeah. Well, and you know, one of the Things you said that brings us back full circle to this idea of perfectionism was what you said. And I think when when you flesh it out, I always tell clients when we're trying to come up with obsessional doubts, they're like, but I don't know. <laughs> it's so funny because it's a parallel to what we're talking about. But I don't know if I got the right one. Right. And I'm like, let's workshop it. And if it doesn't answer the questions for us, then that will come about naturally. And, and that'll help us do some foundational stuff underneath that. But what you were saying through that as you were kind of fleshing it out is you're like, yeah, because more or less you didn't use this word, but not wanting to commit to something for fear of making a mistake. Mm -hmm. And fear of making a mistake. What is perfectionism? I think, I think it's even more than that. But I'm just saying you were saying that and it, yeah. it, it brings it back to this concept of perfectionism because perfectionism is about wanting it to be perfect, not wanting to make a mistake, not settling for less than ideal. And it is impossible yeah, I to think, find perfect. I think a lot of people out there would say that it's the fear of making an irreparable mistake that people, I think, fear the most. They're like, at least for me, actually, I'll just speak for me. I was afraid of making irreparable mistakes, like mm -hmm. things that once you do, they're done. It's like, I don't know, like things that are non-reversible things. There's, There's a... very few things, though, that I would say are absolutely irreversible. Say you're in a relationship and you decide to get married. You may not want to get a divorce. You may not want to separate. You may not want to be widowed or a widower. But absolutely, like aside from someone totally being taken out of the equation, you can choose to absolutely. separate. You can choose to divorce. It doesn't. And, and I'm not saying they're like, yeah, go do that. I'm just saying, like, the, the idea is often the construct in our head that it's irreversible. Absolutely. There is one time when we were dating. I had a car that had many mishaps and problems over time. But I remember once my car broke down and I was in the field off seeing clients and it, and it broke down somewhere in L.A. And I ended up having it towed to a handyman shop and it was going to be expensive. And this was before like online. This is, this makes me feel a little old, but it's before like online banking apps made it easy to transfer within an app or something to that effect. Oh, man. And so I remember like, oh, I was going to pay to fix this car. It was going to be so much. It was ridiculously expensive. And so I was like, oh, but, and I had money in my savings, but I need to move it over to my checking. I was like in an IHOP flipping out. Right. And I remember <laughs> calling Patrick and he was like, what do you want me to log in? I think you could do it through the computer that you couldn't do it though easily from a phone. And I found out there was a chase like nine blocks away and I'm in heels 
and I'm in like professional clothes and I'm like, no, I'm going to walk the nine blocks through this like, kind of sketch area of town because I need to transfer. Oh, yeah, it. I remember this. But I remember Patrick being like, well, you can delegate some of this off. And I'm like, I can't. I oh, can't. Yeah. The reality was I totally could. I could have just put it on a credit card. I could have had my maybe boyfriend, maybe fiance, I don't remember if we were dating or engaged yet, transfer money over. I could have given him, you know, whatever. But I was like, no, I can't. And and if I give him my password and this and that, I'm like, right? <laughs> and so instead, I walked nine blocks down. I transferred money and walked nine blocks back to the car repair having a lot of anguish and really it was a situation that it has to go this way or else was in my mind and i really had probably greater risks if i think about it walking down there and back (laughs) than i did had i just allowed myself to be a little more mentally flexible but yeah it's really interesting and i feel like i may have seen something to this effect in my ICBT treatment group. But also I found this really interesting blog. It's on a website and I'll, I will list it there on the blog over at ocdfamilypodcast.com where I list all resources and citations used during any given episode. But I found this really interesting article where the conversation shifted and it said what we need to really think about is is not necessarily how uncertainty lends itself to ROCD. And he wasn't actually even talking about ROCD, but I felt like this was a perfect fit for my conceptualization around ROCD. And he talked about, actually, it's more about ambivalence. (laughs) Ambivalence. Now, some people will use uncertainty and ambivalence synonymously, but I don't think it is. I think uncertainty really doesn't have a, I could hedge my bets and I kind of see the clear path, but I'm feeling anxious and what if, what if. I think uncertainty is like, I don't know what's going to happen, right? Right. Uncertainty right. is a cancer diagnosis. Yes, you could die. Maybe you won't. I don't know what's going to happen. You go through treatment. Right. I don't know what's going to happen, right? right? Right. Ambivalence is a little bit different because ambivalence really talks about having that pull, that wrestling, that mixed feeling, really, of I can see pros and cons. And when we think about relationship OCD, oh my gosh, right? If someone had no pros, why are you with them? Some of y'all, <laughs> some of y'all are like, right, Creech? Very it's, few people have no pros. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm sure there's some. <laughs> right. And so it's, it's that difference of going, I can see the positive and the hard. And so what I found really interesting about this guy's write-up, and again, I'm going to link it, and I'll even look up the dude's name so we can know him more than just the guy. But he talked about a couple different scenarios, not just within relationships. And I'm going to read this. So it says, over the years, many of my clients have discussed an inability to make up their mind when confronted with an important choice. Which career path to follow? Where to vacation? Spend some extra money? Whether to accept a job offer, etc.? One client couldn't decide which of two men she wanted to date on an exclusive basis and went endlessly back and forth between them without ever committing to either one. Oh, man. I was like, oh, look. Welcome to 2024. Welcome to ROCD, right? Yeah, yeah. He said, in my experience, there are various reasons why people have such a hard time choosing, but at the base, they usually reflect idealized expectations and an underlying perfectionism. Exactly. And he That's was making was that. Exactly. That's why I was like, go. Oh. Well, thank you. Because I didn't necessarily start there. And we've talked about perfectionism, OCD, a little bit on the show. It would actually be a great topic to, to really delve into even more on its own. Mm-hmm. But if we really think about it, some of the perfectionism around the what if, what if I could be happier what if i could be like again like we said for sure you could be happier or you could be less happy right yep that's not the question in fact that's pretty normal concern this is why we call dating dating right yep could you be happier yeah but could this be also really good what if i'm not always attracted maybe i look at the person and i'm like oh my gosh i don't know if i'm finding them attractive right now uh hi human brain welcome 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 to earth 
Well, there are so many of these ideas that I should always think that my partner is the funniest, sweetest, sexiest, most amazing, most handsome, most beautiful. You don't most... think that all the time. I think you're amazing. Thank you. I accept that. That's right. <laughs> you are an amazing seven. I am. <laughs> and I love you. Uh, and, and, but here's the other part. And this is, reminds me of a conversation from our past too, with, we were talking about some of the friends and, and some of the guys in particular, like dudes would be like, I will only date a 10. Of course, no 10 existed. And the dude was like a two, right? Yep. And so, and, and then this goes back to, you know, and I can say for me, for you, for any of us, like we can go, okay, my partner's maybe a seven, right? But you got to remember, you're not perfect either. And men tend to think they're about five points better than they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's be honest. So in terms of like going, oh my gosh, can I be okay with a seven? What do you think you are? I mean, yeah. maybe a seven. Hopefully, right? Maybe Look, we're not. All, we're, we're all, all a in seven. perfect. Nobody's a ten. And so I'm not trying to take, if you're the kind of person that's like, but there is a one true love. I'm not trying to yuck on your yum, okay? But what I am trying to say is, even if you're sitting there going, but Nicole, listen, deal. There is a one perfect person out there for me. There is a one person out there that you may go, this is the one person for me. But they ain't perfect. And neither are you. And that's where it comes down to it. Mm -hmm. Right? Because can you see no clear path forward? No. You can see positive. So they're such a good person. They're caring. They take care of this. And they always think about that. And they have good credit or whatever the thing is. Right? Mm -hmm. And then on that same token with the same person. But mm -hmm. I don't know. They do this thing. And it's kind of annoying. And, blah, 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 and, and they can get caught up on the little things. Guess what? We all have those things. You do yep. some annoying shit too, sweetheart. Like we, we all have those things. Right? Every relationship accepts a set of problems with their partner. Yeah. I read a book one time. There was a sentence in there like, Bobby went to a party with his wife, Mary. Bobby got jealous that his friend, Joe, his wife doesn't give him a hard time about X, Y, Z. But what he doesn't know is that Joe's wife doesn't let him go out with his friends to the bar on Saturdays the way Bobby's does. And it's just like on and on. And the point is every single time you see another relationship and you're like, but they have something that I want. It's like, yeah, but I guarantee there's things you have they don't have well, every time. And it's like we were talking every about time. last week. I was talking with John Hirschfield and he was saying it's irrelevant to compare those things. It is. But what's also missing from that story is that Joe leaves his hair shavings in the sink. Exactly. Whatever the other dude's name, he was forgettable. Bobby. So, first of all, that's not going for him. Yeah, Bobby. And Bobby leaves the toilet seat up. No one's perfect. There's, right. There's going to be that annoying stuff. Yeah. And that's okay. And so, if anything, for this Valentine's Day, it's to pop that balloon that there could be a more, per of course, there's a more quote unquote perfect ideal person out there that's better faster fitter stronger smarter funnier cleaner whatever the thing is but the reality is that perfect doesn't exist that's right okay so we're gonna end it on a light since <laughs> we're imperfect we're gonna have some fun together and I created a game called Doubt Much. And this was inspired if you've ever played the game Ransom Notes, where you get some random words and you're given a prompt and you have to come up with a response with these random words to define the different meanings. So I have some examples here. Who doesn't love an example, Patrick? Exactly. I, well, I, mean, <laughs> I need examples. I learn from visual observation usually. So an example here... If the prompt was something like, what does response prevention mean? Okay, so response prevention is the latter half of exposure and response prevention. You would pick from these random words. Here's an example. It says, face fear, no more sticky brain. So ah, okay. we use those random words. Another example, describe the OCD bubble. No correct drama. There you go. Right? It's yeah. made up drama. It's imagined. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. okay. So this is how we're going to do it. We have different cards, and it has to fit in your bubble. So I have these. These are going to be attached on the blog over at OCDFamilyPodcast.com. Just look for this episode's blog, and you too can download the Doubt Much game. 
And so what you're going to do, there's about seven or eight-ish words that can fit in here, folks, because this is always going to be even more helpful if you use specific themes that come up within your family or your loved ones. I have a blank page where you can put in words that may be more applicable to what's going on in your household. So what we're going to do is maybe I'll have you pick two cards and I'll pick two cards. You can create your own cards. I've also made ERP and ICBT themed cards. So why don't you pick one of each and I'll pick one of each and then we'll see how that goes. So which question would you want to do first? Uh, give an example of an intrusive thought. Okay. Here we go. Done. Done. Okay. What you got? Okay, so the question was an example of an intrusive thought. Uh -huh. I have, dad, fear they throw sick child. <laughs> <laughs> we have very similar ones. I said, mom not pray, child sick. <laughs> nice. We're very much parents, aren't we? We're parents, and I like how we uh, you know, really personalized it to our roles there. Yeah, okay. exactly. That is funny. Yeah. Okay. How about this? Okay. I'm going to do describe an unusual compulsion. Depending on how it goes, you could set a timer or you could go, yeah, we could do it in a minute or less. But if you find a dragon on, you could set a timer. All right. What you got? I have quickly wipe, soak, right arm. Oh my gosh. We're, <laughs> we're like two brains. You're my perfect, imperfect seven. <laughs> I said, throw tell quickly. Stop danger. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's do one of each ICBT. All right. Okay. So ICBT, create an obsessional story. All right, create an obsessional story. Okay. Okay, I think we got it. I totally got it, and I right. love it. It'd be like a motto. <laughs> it could, as an obsessional story. I guess. I mean, do we want obsessional No, we don't. We don't. Mottos? All right, you go first. It's like I could live by this obsession. You go first. Okay, my right. obsessional story says, me not help her, heart danger, dead. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I wrote, dad not help, they dead. <laughs> you see, some people are the same kind of imperfection, <laughs> evenly matched on all three of them. Dad so not help, they dead. <laughs> to me, not help her. Heart danger, dead. <laughs> okay, we'll do one more. Okay, okay, one more. That's funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Weird. That is weird. We're like so married. I know. Okay. How about list an example of irrelevant evidence? Okay. So evidence this that will be does hard not one. count yeah. as, a, as valid evidence. Come on, Morris. This is a really hard one. I got one. He's got one. What you got first? <laughs> Airport 13, me danger. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I'd see it was that. worth the wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mine was they argue. Stop love. Yeah, stop, stop love. Stop love. All right, Morris. Well, thank you for coming back. And it was a really good conversation. I think it's really helpful to think about these things because often, how many people, I, I've said it, I'm sure. How many people go, how do you tell the difference between ROCD and normal relationship anxiety? And people will say, well, if you have to ask, that means you're obsessing about it. And that's not, <laughs> that's not working, right? Because no. it is, it, it, the problem isn't asking and embracing the uncertainty. You know, I feel like ERP sometimes would look like, yeah, maybe they are the wrong person. I guess I'll never know. Right. And really, if we think about this from the ambulance lens, then we go like, no, we know that they're great. And we also know that they're flawed. And if we think about this really being more of a wrestling with, I'm still looking for perfect. This isn't perfect, but this is great. I don't want to let go of this. 
But there could be something out there better. This really boiling down to a wrestling with perfectionism and it perfectionism OCD, is. I think that is a much more helpful route. Now, again, it's not to say that you can't ERP or OCD. More so, I think my point is people get this wrong. I've gotten it wrong before. I oh, think yeah. people get it wrong. So if anything, this Valentine's Day, whether you've wrestled with this in your relationship or you have a loved one that is sitting there battling with this and you're like, oh, my gosh, what can I say? I think it's in part if you're really struggling and you suspect ROCD, think about getting into therapy. And if you're already in therapy, talk to your therapist about it. If you're not in therapy, this could be a really helpful ally to be able to do that. But also, I don't think this is about uncertainty, because if we think about uncertainty, it's I don't know the path forward. Is the yeah. cancer going to kill you? I don't know. It could, but it might not. Treatments work and they don't. Right. We have no way of knowing. This is more of a situation of, no, I know that this person's great and I know they suck. <laughs> you know, what else do I? Right. And really. Being able to identify that this is more of a, I'm seeking an ideal that doesn't exist. Absolutely. I'm also not ideal. And right. that is what exists yeah. here and there now. Exactly. And so both of us, sometimes sevens, maybe sometimes twos, sometimes in between, we're going to have our moments. Is the question, am I looking for something better? Of course, there's something better out there. Is there something worse out there? Of course, there's something worse out there any given moment and this doesn't stay static but being able to really understand oh if i if i dress this from a perfectionism lens and realize i can embrace mistake or not that there actually is no such thing as perfection and the here and now is yeah this person has flaws but they also have things i love about them and so for today i choose them mm -hmm. 100 percent. then that's I think that's beautifully said. You just think about it. To think about the ideal, if you think about it even from like when Carl Robbins was on and he was talking about guiding attention from here and then into your obsessional story, you really have to dissociate to go into that. So if I'm sitting there comparing against the ideal, am I even here? No, I really have to go out of the current moment. That makes sense. The reality is nothing is ever going to be perfect. But also, when we're in our head, we're not actually being able to engage with each other in relationship because we are off. We are off in our imagination, right? Absolutely. The ideal can only, only exist in the imagination. Absolutely. And so really drawing attention back to the present and going, you know what? In the present, maybe this kind of sucks, but it's kind of wonderful. And it's this delicious misery of I love this person, but these different aspects are really hard. That's ambivalence. This isn't a problem with uncertainty. This is a problem with me going, man, there's some really good stuff and there's some really shitty stuff and I don't know how to make sense of it. Yep, absolutely. And being able to face that there is no perfectionism. That is that is really the key. Yep. So anyway. With that, happy love week, babe. There you go. You too, babe. Yeah, and thank you, Patrick, for coming. Absolutely. I know we just did our game episode, so this wasn't all about games, but it was a great conversation. I it was a lot of fun. It was. It's always fun coming here. It's always Aww. fun. Thanks, boo. Love you. Love you. Thank you for that. Oh, I love that. I do. <laughs> You know, we've never had this conversation per se, particularly around perfectionism in relationships or, hey, seven. <laughs> but this was a really helpful and a useful conversation. And honestly, one that I don't think we could have had in this way, at least, if we hadn't both invested the time and the work in our own mental health. So another huge thanks to my boo for his time, his insight, and his sharing. And that brings us to the intrusive thought segment, which... As I shared earlier, is the application segment of my show. And as promised, I'm bringing it back to you and me, fam. Back to this concept of self-love. Because though just like in relationship, we're never going to be perfect. We'll have strengths, we'll have challenges, and sometimes we'll just feel like a whole ass mess. <laughs> but there's still a lot to love about ourselves. And showing love to ourselves is a really important, compassionate, and grace-filled way to give ourselves permission to not only be human, aka imperfect, but to recharge and renew our focus, our drive, and our goals. Because if we want to be able to help our loved ones, and we do, I know we do, we have to be able to help ourselves. So I made up a quick worksheet this week, which I use with some of my clients, I've answered for myself, 
And then I invited some of the sweetest little helpers around, my kiddos, to participate as well. And I'm going to attach it over on the blog along with the Doubt Much game and other resources. But it's a simple little exercise that simply reads, I love that I dot dot dot. And then there's space for you to say what you love about what you can do, about who you are, and about what you have. For kiddos, I find sometimes drawing this out, but hey, adults can have some art time too. Feel free to express this in whatever way you want. It's a little spin on love, a value-driven spin that helps us reflect on our self-love in these specific ways. So I'm going to invite my little helpers to complete this exercise, and I want to challenge you to complete it too. So listen in as my kids share their thoughts and their feelings with us fam. My name is Emma. It's Emma. Okay, what do you love that you can do? I love that I can play with you. Aww. And I love that I am. I love that I am nice. Nice? Anything else? Good. Yeah. I am funny. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. One last thing. I love that I have my mom. Oh, baby. I love that too. Thank you for helping me with this. My name is Luke. Okay, I have this quick little thing. I was wondering if you could help me with it. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. What do you love that you can do? I love that I can do gymnastics. What's your favorite part of gymnastics? Bars. Do we have a bar here? We do have a bar. What about vault? You seem to really like vault too. Yep, I do. That's true. Next one is, I love that I am calm and happy. Oh, you are. And last but not least, I love that I I have train toys. Yeah. What do you like to do with your train toys? Do you like to run them on a track? Yeah. Do you like the sounds they make? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. I love you. Jack, so you see my paper here? What's it say? I love that I can. Hmm. I love that I'm able to do parkour and Roblox. Yes. What is parkour? Parkour is a difficult obstacle course where you have to jump on things. That sounds difficult. <laughs> yes. It's easier on Roblox. Like, in real life, I would probably fall and break a leg. Yeah. So there's a little less risk in Roblox? Yep. Yeah. Next, I love that I am. So can you tell me what you love that you are? I love that I am able to run really fast, swing on a swing all by myself, and bite my OCD on escalators or scary roller coasters. Oh, no, I didn't even put you up to saying your OCD. It wasn't always easy to fight OCD, huh? Yeah. But that's true. You did just recently really master riding on escalators. Yeah. yeah. The first one that I got used to doing on escalators was going up. Yeah. Because I thought of going down is scarier. But then I realized it really isn't so bad. I love that. Okay, last but not least, I love that I have. Can you fill in the blank? I love that I have been super smart at school. Yes, you have. What's your favorite subject? Do you have a favorite? I'm kind of still deciding. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. I love you. Oh, fam. I'm their mom, so, I mean, bias. <laughs> but I am just loving them sharing about what they love about themselves. It is so pure. It is so innocent. It is so authentic. And like I said, I did this too. And I have to be honest, I actually felt pretty special after I answered some of those things. It was such a good grounding reminder. And hey, well, Jack knows that my podcast and our time together is about OCD. He didn't have to say he loves OCD. In fact, he could not touch that with a 10-foot pole because we know what kind of torture and terror OCD can bring to our sufferers, to our families. But not only did he bring it up, after seeing the peace and courage he has had grow tenfold as he's mastered so many obsessional doubts this year, I'm not surprised either. Because he's proud of himself, fam. He knows. 
I know. Gosh, I'm guessing you know what all that means, how hard he had to work for that. And so not only is he proud, but he loves that about himself. I mean, it's so beautiful. So since I was so encouraged by his insight and strength, I wondered if he might have a word or two that he would like to share with you, fam. And golly, I'm glad I thought to ask, because here is what he had to say. Okay, last question for you if you're up for it. If someone listening is feeling really sad or afraid because of their OCD, what advice would you have for them to help them get through it? You are the boss! OCD is not the boss of you. You are. Oh, I love that. Also, don't let OCD make you super scared that you don't do something, or else you'll miss out on fun. Oh, that's true. Just like with the roller coasters? Yeah. Yeah. That's such great advice. You're so smart. I love yes. it. <laughs> Thank you for joining me and our OCD family community. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please like and subscribe to the OCD Family Podcast wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Did you find this content helpful? Please consider leaving a review. The more people that know they're not alone, the better. For more information regarding today's podcast, please visit OCDFamilyPodcast.com and remember to join the email list while you're there. It will provide you with the most up-to-date information, resources, and the demo on the family chatter. Oh, yeah. Nothing says family like being the boss of me, not OCD. That's right. I went there. And you can too at OCDFamilyPodcast.com. <laughs>